constituents at town halls in their home districts. Here is just a little taste of some of the spicy flavor from last night. Spicy. Mm -hmm. We have uh, in the White House now a notorious white nationalist as a special advisor to the President of the United States. I'd like to know your thoughts on that. First of all, I don't speak for the President. I think the president We'd like to know how you feel that. about it. You're our Congressman. You're yes. Congressman. Yes. You have to acknowledge that we got too damn many people on food stamps in Kentucky. These coal jobs are not coming back, and now these people don't have the insurance they need because they're poor. If you can answer any of that, I'll sit down and shut up like Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> <laughs> Mitch McConnell liked that one, liked the Elizabeth Warren reference at the end there. Our panel's back to discuss this. Jackie Kucinich, Errol Lewis, Matt Lewis. Matt, I want to start with you because you are on the right side, right wing side of things. And, you know, Donald Trump, as well as many Republicans, are trying to suggest that this is not organic. This is not a grassroots feeling that some of these people have been sent by left-wing agitators or some sort of professional group. But when you hear all of the anger and sort of the disparate points they bring up, it sounds as though it is an organic groundswell. How do you see what's going on out there? Uh, FDR used to say nothing happens in politics by accident. Conservative leader Morton Blackwell says nothing moves in politics unless it's pushed. That is how things work. Um, do people, are, is this organized? Of course it is. Are there liberal agitators and activists uh, tracking down where town hall meetings are and then emailing and communicating, tweeting, hey, let's all go to this, or, let's go to this uh, town hall? Of course they are. That's how it works. That doesn't diminish from this process. I think that, that it's still perfectly legitimate. People are, are very passionate about it. Um, this, but this is how politics works. Of course it's organized, but there's nothing wrong with that. Right, but also, uh, another wise man once said, quoting weighty words does not necessarily add weight to an argument. There is nothing quantifiable, Errol, about this being baked in, you know, or this being non-organic. Uh, sure, to Matt's point, there's a little bit of, e of everything when we see this kind of thing. But you listen to those accents. If you listen to the tapes, the raw tapes of where the people are from, uh, there are a lot of real constituents concerned about real issues. Is it a mistake to dismiss it as artifice? Well, yeah, and, and r the reality reality is they're dismissing it, I think, for the cameras. You've got to say something, right? Why did 200 people just come and shout down the local Republican congressman? You've got to have an answer for that. The, the reality is they're going to have to get very strategic about this because uh, once the big players get involved and they look at what I consider probably a, a, an authentic groundswell from a lot of different corners. Some people are feminists, some people are, are union workers, some people are concerned about their health care. Lots of different reasons that people are coming out. But well, the, what everybody in the pro political profession is going to look at is what does this mean for 2018? Uh, will the Democrats figure out which 23 to 24 seats they can try and flip in order to take control of the House of Representatives? How will the Republicans defend? That, I think, is really what this is going to very quickly turn into. The big players are going to come in and sort of step all over this authentic groundswell of, of, of public sentiment. This is what we saw happen in the uh, 2010 elections with the Tea Party. Jackie, some of these senators are trying to be more strategic, to Errol's point. For instance, Senator Joni Ernst in Iowa. She tried to keep it narrow so that it wasn't this influx of angry people. She tried to just have it in a room that held 100 people. She said it was going to be just contained to veterans' issues, so people obviously won't shout down veterans. It didn't work. So people were, you know, standing room only, lined up down the halls because mm -hmm. people are looking for um, an outlet. Yeah, and they do ignore this at their own peril. Maybe some of this is, some of this I'm sure is organized. That said, uh, you know, I'm old enough to remember the Tea Party in 2010 when Democrats said that they were astroturf and then they lost the majority. <laughs> so this is something that could turn into a bigger movement and, uh, you know, Republicans shouldn't ignore that. And I think the ones that so far have handled this uh, the best have said, yeah, these are my constituents too, uh, Mark Sanford, for example, um, and I need to listen to them. Whether or not they agree, that's their job. Their job is to listen to all of their constituents, not just the ones that agree with them. And I'll tell you, boy, when you go home, it's so much different than D.C., Matt. I mean, that's the real point. You saw our friend Marsha Blackburn there. You know, she ducks our questions on a regular basis. It's different 
when you're sitting with a constituent and you duck their question, they put it right back in your face. And now it's not about the theatricality of an interview anymore. You have some accountability and it's going to be real everywhere, right? I mean, th this, this notion that the only people who are upset are the people who voted for Trump. He had well over two million people voted against him because they were equally angry. And you're seeing that play out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, you go back home in your district and it's people you know, people you might even run into on the street. Uh, and, and, and you have to have answers. I, I tell you, I think that it's very important. You can have videos of, of constituents saying things and, and being rowdy. That won't hurt a politician. What hurts a politician is if they are under pressure and they slip up and mm. say something stupid. And so mm -hmm. if you have a candidate or, a, you know, a, a politician like a John McCain, Put them out there. Let them, br you know, bring on, bring on the questions. But if you have a candidate who's not going to be comfortable with this, you're seeing things like teletown halls, right, where they're ducking oh, the yeah. town halls. They're just doing conference calls. You're going to see different strategies to try to manage this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, all right, let's talk about the wave of anti-Semitism across the country. We've seen bomb threats, as we know, uh, called into various Jewish community centers. So there had been a um, call for President Trump to speak out vociferously about this. Yesterday, he did speak out about it. So let me play this for you, Errol. The anti-Semitic threats targeting our Jewish community and community centers are horrible and are painful and a very sad reminder of the work that still must be done to root out hate and prejudice and evil. So, Errol, what does this tell you, that he was listening to people who said he had to come out and address it head on? It's, it's a, a rare reaction, I think, to public pressure, for sure. Um, even his daughter was uh, sort of tweeting some sentiments in the direction of, hey, you can't just pretend this doesn't exist. Uh, on the other hand, there's an oddly passive quality to that, if you even just listen to the phrasing, right? We saw him at the convention, and really on most issues, Donald Trump says, I alone can fix it. He says, I'll get us 4% growth. I'll take care of ISIS. Everything's going to turn around as soon as I get involved. On this, he says, well, gee, this is, this is pretty awful. Somebody ought to do something. So, um, you know, for, for people who feel very embattled, uh, and it's a very real feeling, this is not even going to get the ball start. I mean, this is, this is the, the, literally the bare minimum he could have done. And I think the mm -hmm. question still remains, why haven't we heard from you before? How come this always escapes your Twitter feed? When are you going to actually do something about this? Right.